Welcome to Admit One with G Money. Today we have the founders of Hue, a Web3 label and entertainment company born in the metaverse, with backgrounds in producing for Selena Gomez and crafting media and product strategy for brands like the NFL and Comcast NBC. They dove into Web3 with the intent to reshape what it means to be an artist, as well as a fan and entertainment. Now, they're here to discuss Hume's Genesis NFT, along with new music from one of their meta stars, Angel Baby. Please welcome David and Jay. Hey guys, what's going on? How you doing, G Money? Well. What's up, G? Good to How's see you, everything? man. You know, I, I want to start off this, this conversation with a disclaimer saying that uh, I'm not only an investor, I'm also an advisor in Hume, right? And I, I remember the first time we met was probably like 14, 15 months ago, I think at this point, I think it was in March of 2021. Yeah. And I remember we were put in touch through uh, a friend of mine and I thought I was taking the call as a, a courtesy call. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was like, I really was like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't know what, what, what I think. And then once we started jamming, David, like we, we went on yeah. I think it was like an hour and a half call. It was, yeah, it was like an hour and a half call. We're, we're yeah. like talking about the metaverse and all this stuff. Yeah, and we were talking about the future and, and everything. And then I think we set up a lunch uh, a few days later, the next week, where you know we met in person. And then we met. I met mm -hmm. Jay, um, and we really just hit it off. I, I I I mean, it was it was crazy how it feels like it's been so long ago, but it you know it's only like you know li uh, under a year and a half, which I guess in NFT yeah. world like twenty years. I remember like. Yeah, at that lunch, you know, we kept the, and it was a lot of like when NFTs go mainstream or if major brands come into the space. And I think we were like, you know, in like three years or like in four years. And it's, and it's like, yeah, in NFT time, it's just felt like five years. But obviously, yeah, the last year and a half, a lot of those things happened so fast. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree, you know. And I guess with that, I want to start with a little bit on your guys' background. So that way people who aren't familiar uh, with Hume or Angel Baby and, and what you guys are working on, like, you know, how did you guys end up here? How did like you guys form, how was Hume formed? Like what's the genesis there and, and what are your backgrounds that kind of led you to that? So yeah, Jay and I, Jay and I have known each other for a long time. I think over 10 years now. Um, it's like 12. We, we've been we've been saying 10 12? for a while. Yeah. <laughs> we just keep saying 10, but it's 12 years now. <laughs> um, known each other for 12 years. We both lived in New York. Um, we were living as roommates in Williamsburg and Brooklyn. Um, and our lives were good friends, but like our lives were totally different. I was working as a media and product strategist at a firm called Vaudeville Ventures in New York. Um, and was working with, you know, like you mentioned, like Comcast, NBC, uh, MGM, and launching a lot of like tech project projects at the intersection of tech and media for them. So like MGM, we launched this streaming platform for a TV show called Stargate. Um, so I was deep in that world, and Jay is still Jay, <clears throat> even at the time, was songwriter and producer. <laughs> so I'd like come home from my you know day in the normal world <laughs> and jay would be like in our apartment like writing music with people um producing songs um and i'll i'll pause there and like let jay tell you know more of where where he was at um and then we'll we'll get to to hume's birth yeah the truncated version for me i started singing when i was seven and from seven until I went to NYU at the Tisch School of the Arts for music, writing, and drama. Singing, writing, performing was, was all I did. Um, and I thought I wanted to be an, an actor, writer who also wrote songs. And, you know, when you're 15 years old, I think you can, you can do every single aspect of it. And I got to school at NYU and I realized I really didn't like just being a part of other people's stories where I wasn't creating and being a part of the storytelling. And I didn't like embodying another person. So I wanted to write my own music and I started a band Then I had a solo project. And in 2017, an artist named Aloe Black 
who his first huge moment was the wake me up when it's all over which was cool because i was a huge fan of that song and that voice and aloe hit me up and said i want to record this song of yours called brooklyn in the summer and that opened me up to this whole universe that uh, is the backbone of the music industry that a lot of people don't know about which uh, is basically people like myself and friends of mine and now Hume creators that are a part of our world who write, produce, creative direct, and build out the full worlds for music and sonic worlds for artists. So yeah, at the time that David was doing all the amazing projects that he was talking about and also sending me these like super nerdy, excited emails about Bitcoin and Ethereum, <laughs> Um, he came in and he was like, wait, so when you do this song with X artist or with Riot Games or Epic or whatever you're doing, you're just building the entire world. Like the artist themselves isn't doing any of that creative work. And I said, yeah, <laughs> that that's what's happening. Except you know, <laughs> then they get to go and put on a $300 million tour and I'm only participating in a very, very small piece of revenue from the music and not just on the money side but in terms of creative control and development like you come in and add incredible value to the world of an artist um and then it's just over so that's when we started to get really excited about the concept of virtual artists and david and way when, ahead of his time talking about like media assets on the blockchain in 2017 yeah, so, yeah 2017 <laughs> okay. So I like, so I quit that job that I had and I just like, I went deep into what well now, you know, we're all calling web three, but like at the time went deep into crypto, went down the Ethereum rabbit hole and spent about like two years. Um, me and a couple of friends had an advisory firm. I think the, the blog still exists. We did like a bunch of research on different protocols. It's called uh, Abacus. So I get really deep into all of this and I started seeing what's coming like NFTs, metaverse any type of you know digital asset on chain um and i'm you know jay and i are talking i'm like this world is going to have virtual artists and those virtual artists are going to have ver digital assets um and in you know the case of what we were talking about like those digital assets are going to be music they're going to be merch um they're going to be videos of shows there's going to need to be live performances in this metaverse so jay and i keep hammering this out and eventually uh we're like okay what does this look like if we really do this if we really try and build a company that now now we call them meta stars because we have we have angel baby but building these creating these virtual artists with their own worlds we don't usually get to talk about but we have more time today and, it, and it's you but I, I always describe it like we were like two two kids with a rock band in their parents' basement in Ohio. And like it just started purely out of fun. Like we're talking about it very technically right now, but we were coming up with character ideas and we were doing like podcasts of these characters. It really was two best friends coming from different worlds, having a lot of fun and having this like huge idea in dream but we talked about it more like yeah that would be amazing if we were to you know quit everything we do and just go and build virtual artists together and we started doing it for fun and it happened it happened really organically um which i think was a cool part of it all like it wasn't super super calculated it was more david kept talking about virtual money's here virtual people are next and I kept saying, oh, I really want to do that. <laughs> and then it just kept <laughs> happening and kept happening. <laughs> and most most people thought we were nuts. Um, like we would talk about this and, you know, it was a lot of that would never happen or like that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, we had conversations with record labels about signing some of these virtual artists. Uh, and, well, I, let's talk about okay. that, right? Because I, oh. I think that that was really interesting. So. Angel Baby was not Hume's <clears throat> first artist, right? Correct. Yeah. Let, well, let's Hume didn't. That. Hume didn't exist. Like Hume's right. not even in the picture. It's just Jay and David trying to tell people about the future and people being pretty rude and slamming doors in our faces. 
Right. And, and so like, let's talk about that. So what was your first foray into the virtual artist, the digital artist? So we had these uh, virtual DJs named Ivan and Peter. We had uh, teamed up with Flula Borg, who's been in Suicide Squad and the Pitch Perfect movies and a bunch of other things. And we start like learning what it takes to create these virtual artists, the backgrounds that you need to give them um what it what the needs are in terms of like putting content out for these virtual artists like you know it's not like you can just put out like one thing a month they need to feel alive they need to be vibrant um so we we learned a lot with ivan and peter um and we were approached by a record label to sign ivan and peter as as artists now they did not they still didn't really understand the concept because we'd be in these meetings and even the, the contract that was offered was like talking about like them owning 15% of my personal entertainment income for the rest of my life as well as Jay's and how they own my voice and they own all the music. And they're offering, by the way, like a, a an advance, which is effectively a loan and not a lot of money. How, um, how big was that advance? It was less than fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> and the way that those deals work is they cascade. So even though it's a deal for only a couple songs, they have the right to continue to option out for five to seven albums. So it starts with two songs, and you're basically locked in. Um, right. We don't so, need yeah, to go so down I that whole path, but. So I mean, I guess like right that I mean that must have been pretty cool. You start. You start working, you start creating these two virtual artists, you get a record deal, right, on the table, and but the terms are, are very exploitative, right? So then what, yes. what happens from there? Well, to add two other pieces, <laughs> it, cause, and this is, again, we don't get to talk about the full scope of it. We also were offered a, a, v, a Google right. VR deal, Um which was much more money, but a similar thing. And David being one thing David is very, very good at is, I think, seeing what's happening in the future and what's coming. And David's like, this, we are way too early. This was in like 2017, 20, yeah. 2018. Yeah. And I think that whole department at Google had ended up shutting down. Um, and then we also were offered a partnership to go pitch the concept of these characters as a show. So what was really interesting is everyone kept coming back and be like, we'll make it a show. And we're like, well, but it's not really about the show. It's about them being alive and acting in the world like they are alive. They are these virtual beings. They're alive. And David's in a boardroom in both of the situations on the TV side and on the music side, talking about digital scavenger hunts on the blockchain. And every <laughs> on the TV side, they're like, well, those are just those are just IP extensions. And we're like, right. no. <laughs> Everything else is an IP extension. Like that yeah. is the IP. That is the brand. That is the thing. Like those virtual artists will then have TV shows and have, you know, cooking products and everything that you can possibly imagine. Those are the extensions. This is the pulse of the whole thing. Right. And eventually we gee, we just say no to every single yeah. deal. And that that was definitely <laughs> tough because I, I did say to David at one point, like, you do know how hard it is to get offered a record deal for a project that literally has zero going on by a major label you know like there's not a lot of those deals offered every year they're they're in the the hundreds um and there are tens of thousands of artists who are vying for those deals and algorithms searching the internet for who these companies should sign um but we said no a lot and I'm very, very glad we did because one year after we said no to that Interscope deal, which, by the way, took nine months of negotiating to try to get it where we wanted it and then just said no. And two weeks after we said no to that was the top of COVID. One year later, we met you. And 14 months later, we're here. Um, so mm -hmm. the power of no is and pretty incredible when you believe in something deeply. Right. And I remember when we met you, I was like, I was like, we had a good phone call, but like, you know, we had had so many meetings now, you know, with super high level people. 
like telling us like, you know, stuff like, yeah, that's interesting. But what about podcasts or like, it should really be a TV show. And we're going to, and like, we sat down with you and you saw, you saw everything we saw. I mean, I think that's pretty, I'll just like, look at the way we're on this uh, <laughs> podcast right now. Like you, you definitely see everything we saw and like where everything's going. And it, it was cool in that moment to sit down with you and finally like have someone and sit down with someone who like just got it. I mean, we didn't, we weren't even explaining. We didn't have to explain things to you. You were like, you're like, yeah, of course, you know, virtual characters are going to have a uh, virtual merchandise. I get it. Um, <laughs> and that was cool to be able to like finally sit down with someone who just got what we were doing and believed in it and even had ideas that, you know, we hadn't fully thought of, you know, quite yet. Right. And I think, so I, I want to go back to that when we met for lunch, right? Because that was, we had spoken on the phone. That was the first time I met Jay. And I remember sitting there and I'm sure people will have this question too, is like, why these guys? Like, why, why are these the guys that are going to do it? Right. And like, cause I remember I was, I think I was, I, I think at the lunch, I was probably more asking Jay questions about like, what is the music industry like? How, you know, what like have you done? Right. Like, and so I kind of want to go into that a little bit because I think that to me really, that conversation was really instrumental in understanding how the music industry works, why, you know, it's very different than, you know, the general public probably thinks it is and why you saw an opportunity for Hume to really kind of thrive. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of questions. About that, that answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, Jay, no, been, we've never, well, we've never, well, my, we've never told you this, but yeah. after that lunch, Jay was like, "Man, I've never been asked that many questions ever that quickly." Before. Yeah. Well, and, and all due respect <laughs> to everyone in my like in beloved music that I love, as many problems as there are in the music industry, like I have so many people who are very close with that I've come up with and met here, but. There's a lot of like bullshit in the music industry. It's like, yo, I love your song. This is great. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And G's coming in and it's more like, okay, so it's 2017. It's September. How exactly do you, what is, explain publishing to me. Explain this to me. And it was just like <laughs> such specific questions. Um, and I really appreciated it. And now that we've met, because I had, I came from a different world. Um <laughs> but it was it was really cool. Yeah, we can we can go into some of that. It because because like I think like the the question I had right at the outset right is like you here you were this singer songwriter you were doing your own music and you know it's like why would you want to go like why would you want to go make uh con like songs for somebody else why would you want to write why would you want to produce for somebody else and I think that that was a conversation that was really eye opening for me at the time because. I think up until that point, I would I knew that like, you know, insert any pop artist here has a team that works with them. But I always thought that like everything, you know, at the end of the day, like it's their it's their baby. And I finding out like that's not the case, right? And so I think that that's super important. I think people would be interested in in that aspect of like what are like the in what what is the inside of the of producing a hit song look like yeah cool i i will preface this with there are a lot of people who like the system as it is um <laughs> i personally believe that it and i love a lot of those people but personally believe that it is fractured and broken um and what i experienced i got into it because i first thought oh this is great i'm going to get to write music in so many genres right like i've had songs that have taken off in that are rock songs, dance songs, R&B songs, pop songs, rap songs, like gotten to work on so much different music and ranging from big artists like we talked about with like Selena or Demi or g Easy and Aloe to then developing music for League of Legends or for Fortnite and being a part of those things. But it left me feeling unfulfilled at the end of it because you put all of this energy into this thing and you don't really own it you you own a little bit of it but you don't really own it and you don't have any control of it and you're now kind of just a passenger in 
a freight train if it's going really well that you have no control over. And otherwise, you're just a passenger in like a burning vehicle that is charred and left on the <laughs> side of the highway in like Wichita, Kansas. And you're like, what the fuck? That was a Tesla, you know? And that got really, really difficult for me. And I made a decision that I wanted to start developing things that I own. I wanted to prioritize ownership. And I had put so much time and energy into developing projects, even as an artist myself. Like when I was in my band, I developed that project and co-produced on everything and wrote the songs and came up with the vision of the clothing and our music videos and everything we did. And so to start doing that with other artists, but then not really being a part of it, just being like a service person, um, I, I don't, I don't want to be a service person. I want to be a entrepreneur and an artist and a creator and build things that I have a deeper stake in. Um, so, and then when we're talking about the song, I'll mention this, I won't mention the name, but one of the biggest artists in the world just came out with an album in the last month. I have a good friend who has two songs on that album. He got two. Guess how many songs he wrote for that project? He got two. I, I, I mean, none, two, three? 850. He spent 25% of his time for a full year. He wrote 850 songs and he got two on it. Now, if those two songs become the biggest songs on the planet, which is very, very difficult. David and I were talking about it last night. He stands to go and get, he could get a huge publishing deal, which means it's an advance. So like a loan. Say he goes and gets a crazy publishing deal, $5 million, $10 million. But now you're just in debt. You're just straight up in 5 or $10 million worth of debt. And any dollar that comes in, you don't receive, they take 100% of it until you recoup the entire advance. Um, so when you just go through like the mechanics of it, artistically, you're just a passenger, but you're giving so much. And then financially, you're either in debt or you're receiving the smallest amount of revenue. So the people who are really, really making money are the ones at like the top, 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 top. And that's a small, small, small amount of people. Um, in an industry the, that doesn't even make that much money as a whole anyway, comparatively, um, and just on and the music the, side and the artists who are making money outside of just the music, the touring, the merch, and then the songwriters who wrote all these big songs that lead to that aren't seeing any of that. Right. Yeah. And I always said that like the music, the money in music is around the music, um, and this I'll separate myself as an artist and just be like business Jay for a second. Um, when you when you think about that, right, like the music is the most important part because it's driving everything. Like what would Drake be without all of Drake's songs or what Kanye is a great example? What would Kanye be without all the music? Why is Kanye a billionaire? It is not from the music. Kanye is a billionaire because of products. Mm -hmm. And tours and, you know movies <laughs> and it's right. like no and, yeah and so i i guess i think that's a really interesting point right because i think so you're seeing all all of this happen and you know that that to me that conversation was an eye-opener right when you were kind of describing and I, I think i was specifically asking i'm like okay so if i'm a writer and i go and i work with you for eight hours a day how much am i getting paid like i was asking you questions like that and you were like, the numbers you were giving me were like so insane. <laughs> I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, I, there's no way that this is real life. Um, how, like knowing what the industry is like and, and how things are uh, and how, what the status quo is, how, how were you looking to change that with Hume? You want me to answer that, David, or do you want to take yeah, a stab can, at it? Yeah, why don't you, why don't you answer that? Yeah. Well, the other piece, let's put everything I just said into a, a tiny box. I'll put the box on my shoulder. The other box to open up was the blockchain, right? And NFTs. And seeing that there was now a new way to distribute and monetize music. 
that was very, very exciting. And I remember the day that I, David was talking, we talked about it, like that all the NFTs will be in like maybe three to five years. This was in like 2019 talking about that. And maybe 10. I remember you saying that sometimes too. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I don't know when it's really gonna. It was like the bear. It was like the deep bear. Eighth was at like three hundred or something. I was like, I don't know when it's gonna come back. Because because the other thing with all of this <laughs> is the way all of this money is collected is archaic. There's no. It's so many different systems. It's not like there's just like one platform and that collects all the money from radio and television, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think about music as NFTs that can change everything you have everything that's provably in one place and also you now have a new opportunity to bring fans closer to artists in a way that we never have before so hume had two aspects that were incredibly exciting for me and for both of us which was one we get to be a part of every single aspect of that artist everything and that for me has been a dream my whole life like that's what you want right you want to be a part of the songs the production the story the videos the clothing the concerts the t the tv shows the nfts and then so you have all of that and then to go and see that there is an opportunity to build what we believe will be the future of a fan to artist nft ecosystem and I'll be careful with how much I say, David, but things that can allow other people as well to interact with their fans um, in ways they never have before. That was yeah. really exciting. Um, and the last piece I'll add is to find a way for Hume to own the music, but also pay songwriters and producers well. Those 850 songs that my friend wrote, he got paid zero for every single day that he wrote any of those songs. The only way he'll make money is if those songs are successful. Every songwriter or producer who works with Angel Baby and works with us gets paid a fee for their time that day. Like they're treated like real humans. And the reason we can do that is because we are a part of all of the revenue. We're not just a record label that's a part of the master royalties and then small percentages like an agency, like 10% of touring or 15% of um, merchandise. It's holistic. We have that whole world. So we're able to pay writers and producers um, we're able to pay, period. And, and they should be. You know, you should well, be paid for I your was, time. I remember the first time I I told Jay, I was like, well, what if we pay the songwriters like any other job that exists on planet Earth to like come to work for the day even if it's like a mod like even if it's just like a like a good hourly amount like just the idea of like paying people to show up to do work and then the other thing was like not making them have to recoup all this stuff like just basically i was like what if we just treat songwriters how every single other person who enters a contract on planet earth is treated at first Jay was like i don't know <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, and then we've been doing that. It has been interesting, and Jay's been closer to this lately than I have, like seeing managers and lawyers um, just like reactions to it. Because there's a lot of, there's still a lot of hand holding that has to go on. It's like, what's this NFT stuff? How does the NFT work? Um, what do you mean you're going to, like, you're actually, you know, so songwriters sometimes, don't, even if you have a hit song, I've seen this with Jay. Jay will have like a huge song and he'll get paid like a year later. Like it'll take or 18 like months later for him yeah. to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people will be like, wait, so you're just going to like pay us up front. <laughs> like, um, so it's, it's been interesting just like seeing people's reactions because it's so different than how things are done, even though I think it makes a lot of sense to you G and people who, aren't in the music industry but you know there are whenever you're you're doing something new um people get confused and need to be you know yeah no hand you gotta help. talk them I, through it you gotta, yeah. you gotta you gotta walk them through it so i guess one of, i mean and 
this is what really got me excited about Hume when we first started talking. And I'd love to know what your experience has been like over the last 18 months is how, like, how has it been to get talent, right? Like has talent, you know, if you're, if you're going to be paying above market rates and, and what, let's say your traditional record label is paying, like how, how has it, how easy or hard has it been to attract talent to your platform and to work with you? I'd say it's been pretty easy. Um, on on the in two two I'll break it down. On the songwriter and producer side, it's been very easy to pull people in who are untethered from very large binding publishing and publishing deals with major music publishers. Um, people whose publishing is like unencumbered and unsigned, and they have control of their world. Um, Song, if we're specific in that world, songwriters who are signed to major publishers, it's more difficult because those publishers essentially own their publishing or a significant percentage of it. So it might be a while before we're able to work with those, with songwriters and producers who are in that position, um, which is a shame because I'm friends with a lot of people in that world. Had I made a very different decision in 2018, I would have been one of those people and wouldn't have even been able to do this. Um, but in terms of interest, that has been a different case. I don't think I've met one songwriter or producer. And I have people now being like, yo, can I can I write with Angel Baby? <laughs> um, so yeah, that part in the last, has been easy. In the last, yeah, and especially in the last three to six months, I think at first it was... You know, to be honest, like Jay, Jay's worked with a lot of songwriters throughout his career. And it was a lot of Jay, like talking to these songwriters, explaining to them how it would work, like making sure they didn't think Jay or I were just like completely out of our minds. And now, especially in the last like three months, six months, I think people have seen like, oh, that Angel Baby thing is like, it's pretty cool. And these songs are dope. And now there's been people wanting to you know, reaching out and being like, I want to write with Angel Baby. Like, how, how, how do I do right. this? Yeah, no, and I, I let's talk in, let's get into Angel Baby for a second, right? Because when we met, you had Ivan and Peter, and, yeah. you know, they were these uh, these two cool, like, quirky German DJs that never showed their face. Yeah. And I liked it, and I'm like, I saw the potential there. Uh, what made you decide to pivot? Uh, and what made you decide to pivot to Angel Baby specifically? So we started talking, it was like March, April of 2021. So right around when Bored Apes launched, I believe, um, right around that spring. So by the time we closed our seed round, it was the end of August. Like we were talking before, that is like a year had gone by in mm -hmm. NFT time. Like yep. Bored Apes had launched, other projects had launched, and... You know, now now we look at it like Board Apes was still very small at that point, but it felt massive. Um, and the big thing, one of the hardest things with Ivan and Peter, um, and one of the hardest things with any artist Jay has ever worked with, just one of the hardest things with an artist, is like how do you get that first group of fans um, and get people to listen to that music? Like who are those first people, and how do you find them, and how do you get to them? And it's it's really difficult. Um, and what we thought of was like, well, there's all these projects now with completely open IP. What if we were able to base our artists instead of Ivan and Peter, like you base the artists off of one of these projects and you, you're not going to guarantee that people are going to love the artists because there's, there's a lot that goes into that. But what you can guarantee is like that community is going to listen to the songs at least once they're probably going to like follow the artist and pay attention for a week or two. And then it's up to you if it's, if it's good or not. Um, so that was like, I think I called Jay and we had like, we had a whole roadmap plan for Ivan and Peter. There was like music created and I called Jay and I was like, well, we might have to like buy one of these NFTs and base our whole, you know, for, first virtual artist or next virtual artist on one of these um, 
let's call it a, a platform or one of these, you know, 10 K projects, because it'll at least give us a leg up in terms of building IP around a com community. Um, and we, we chose, uh, Jay, Jay, I don't know if you want to give a disclaimer, Jay, cause yeah, maybe we, I'll, we usually, well, I'll say, I'll say two um, things. Yeah. I'll say two things. One. And I remember we talked about this with you G around this time, which was what it felt like to me was you had the entire punk rock movement, right? Everybody with the clothing and ethos and philosophy and parties and vibes, but there were no artists. And it was just a huge opportunity to see this world and uh, ecosystem of people who were just ready for an artist, but didn't have one. Um, and that, that was a big part of it mm -hmm. and, and a big piece of what allowed us to pivot in what I think was seven days. I think we closed the round and we shifted yeah. <laughs> in seven days. Um, it was pretty nuts. Um, and then I'll just say this piece so we can keep talking about it technically because Angel Baby would be insulted if I, I didn't say this. Um, but another thing that helped us mm -hmm. shift was around that time David and I were in the Angeles Forest, which is a place we go to just think and get away from everything here in California. And we ran into Angel Baby. We run into this fully physical seven foot rabbit from the future who was with another meta star that for reasons of safety with the Zani Republic and not knowing if they are here or what's going on, we don't talk about. So we don't have to get too much in the narrative, but we also met Angel Baby. <laughs> And it was a huge moment for us because we were like, first of all, we knew we were fucking right. Like all these haters, everybody telling us that this was crazy and stupid. And Angel Baby tells us about their future and what is going to happen in the trajectory of our world, or at least what has happened. And that virtual artists and meta stars um, are at the core of entertainment in the future, but they lived in a closed metaverse and now that they were here and, you know, that story will continue to develop and people will learn more about Angel Baby's world and the Hume world. But it is essential that we support Angel in finding their sound here in 2021, becoming a superstar and building a Hume collective that is determined to create an open metaverse and preserve the art of expression because Angel and the other meta stars lived in a world where they were forced into hiding, where they were censored. So you also had this unbelievable artist that we just met and they were from the Fluff World project that already had aspects of music to the project and multi-layered NFTs. And then we met them all and they were super cool. So I'll let you take over David from like a technical side um, in how this concept of new, the, the, this new world of IP allowed us to develop Angel Baby in a way that really wasn't even possible um, a month before we met you, G. Like it, it wouldn't have even been possible. Yeah. Like it all happened so fast. So fast. Um, and we had to move fast. And we knew that. We knew we had about, I think we said it, we're like, we have three months before this starts to explode in a way where we'll be late. So we need to move like, next week and i think next week was like labor day i have my cousin's wedding and we're like no <laughs> i'm talking to david at three in the morning um but yeah yeah so so yeah i mean the, there was a lot it was like okay should we you know we could have spent a lot of money and done a board ape there were lots of options but with fluff world they did have these like multi-layered nfts where music you had like your pfp they you know they exist right now you had your PFP, you had a background scene, and then you actually had a piece of music, um, which they call a Nimbus, which is attached to the PFP. And you can swap your music in and out. So we were looking, we we're like, and um, we're like, this project already is connected to music. Like we need to reach out to these people because, you know, who knows what else they have planned. And, you know, long story short, it was, you know, the it's been the a perfect um collaboration because 
even Angel Baby's first move, we were able to have Angel Baby and Hume got in a fight. Angel Baby went out to the desert um, and Angel Baby sent out this tweet, like, I'm in the desert. And all these fluff holders started changing their background scene, which is an NFT in itself, to a desert background. And then Angel Baby, as a token of like thanking all these people for helping find them and helping helping them, airdrop them all a Nimbus sound of their song NFT. So now all these fluff holders cool. could attach their NFT sound to their PFP. So, and it was just, it was cool. Just like seeing all these people take a piece of music, attach it to their PFP. And it's almost oh, like a cool. new version of hanging that like, concert that a uh, concert poster on your wall or something like that was like the, the first time we like saw that we're like okay this yeah like in in work. some ways and sorry to I mean, interrupt you yeah. but before i just just forget it that was like the first time a band had a t-shirt like in a lot of ways that's yeah. what that was that was the first new t-shirt where you as an angel baby fan said oh you know what i want to rep uh this song on my pfp and now you could now we're seeing a lot of people kind of tap into communities, tap into, uh, you know, different PFP projects and try to kind of play to that audience, uh, right, you know, right from the, the get-go. But you guys were like the first people to do it. You know what I mean? Like you guys, I, I don't think, I mean, I'm trying to think. I, I don't think I, I saw anybody do I, it before you guys. I think we, I think we were first um, mm -hmm. to do it like that. And, um, and then we kept doing it. And the other, the other great thing, and G was, you know, we, that community was so focused on music that happened. And then in November, there was a live performance. Angel Baby performed at Art Basel, which you were there. It was awesome. And we, you know, now everybody likes Angel Baby and people talk about Angel Baby and it's just like taken for granted that Angel Baby is cool and has good music. But before that Art Basel performance, we were like, holy sh how are we going to get all these like honestly like angel baby was going on at midnight so we're like it's gonna be a bunch of drunk people who've just seen like real humans on stage we need to get them to pay attention to a giant screen and think that this giant seven foot bunny is as cool as like kanye or travis scott or you know billy eilish and there was a lot of like meticulous thinking into like how to do that performance in a way that would do that. And even going into that night, we we're like, you know, I remember Angel Baby first came on and I'm like looking around. And I'm like, all right, like, let's see. Are people going to laugh right now? Or are people going to like think this is cool? And when I saw like when I saw people take out their cell phones like people do at for a human artist and start like recording Angel Baby's like intro speech and then Angel Baby like rapping and going through the song. That was another moment of like, holy shit, like this is really, this is really working. The time is working right now for people to be able to like resonate and fall in love with a virtual artist. And this can keep going. When is it that you guys came out with the song NFT? When Or that Angel Baby came out with the NFT song? So that was, that was like, a month. Oh, is that NFT NYC? So the song came out at NFT NYC, um, had a lyric video that went up on YouTube. Um, like you, you tweeted about it. A bunch of people were tweeting about it and it got I mean, a lot of, I loved it. That, I thought, that I thought the song yeah. was great. Like I thought the song was awesome. I was like, this would be, this would be a banger, you know? And, and I guess oh with that, I kind of want to segue a little bit, uh, into what you guys have been working on since then you know you have a, a new music nft uh with the other is it is it called the other side it's called the other side right it's called the other side yeah it's called the other side you know how is that how is that tying into the genesis nft and and what was what was you know the what's the origin story behind the other side song well i think Jay, why don't you answer, you know, the origin story, but I think to bring it back to what we were, we were talking about before too, with like songwriters and Angel Baby had a songwriting camp, um, in the winter spring with a, 
bunch of songwriters, just like the biggest artists on earth will have a camp with a bunch of songwriters. And we came out of that camp with tons and tons of music. Um, and then from there, the team was able to like, be like, okay, what makes sense for, you know, this first release? And specifically, we were thinking like, how, how do we get other communities involved? Um, and maybe there's a way here, you know, at this point, other artists, exist, music artists exist in these other communities. And maybe there's a way, you know, for these, this next batch of Angel Baby releases to all be featuring an artist from a different community. So that was part of the inspiration. And Well, and going back to what we said before, if you're working together to build something that is so community based and this was a big thing that happened at the camp with angel baby where angel was like well how can i do this if i'm not showcasing and collaborating with people from these other communities um and the other side actually uh that idea the song happened supernaturally and it was about um just this concept of angel baby feeling so disconnected from all of these people that they love in the future. And those lyrics in the chorus, like, uh, I don't want to live in a world if it's not with you. I don't want to die in a world with not that's if it's not with you, which is just such a core human feeling that we've all felt in some way with someone that you love, whether it's a friend or a family member or someone you've been in a relationship with. And we were listening it to it the next day. And the original lyric, I think, was, uh, now it's like, see you on the other side. You on the other side. And originally it was like, I don't want to live or die. Don't want to live or die. And it had this whole feeling. And we're listening to it. And we're like, this doesn't still is missing something. If we're going to make this a collaboration with the Board Ape community, like it needs something more. And just shifted that lyric to see you on the other side. And the whole song came together and that was the first one it was really inspiring and now we have about we have a bunch that are collaborations inspired by different communities and we're working on figuring out different ways to collaborate with those communities organically um yeah it's been exciting getting so to how, expand like that so how long how long did other side take to write Right. And, and how many, how many like people went to the camp? Like how, how big was that group when, when you had all those collaborators there? Other side was quick. I would say the song was probably done like in an hour and a half max, maybe less. The actual wow. writing of the song, that, that song was like, right. that song happened fast. And I knew I felt it in my gut or like looking at, there was a uh, four of us. Yeah, it was Angel Baby, myself, Brandon Burnett, and Dallas Catton. It was the four of us there. And it was also, now the song happens in an hour, but there was months of preparation in terms of developing the tracks, developing the sound, mm, working with right. Angel Baby, the honing sound? the vision. Say that again? So the, the soundtrack, like the, the actual beat was made before. Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Process-wise, right. I mean, I don't know. I, I won't give away uh, every aspect of my process. Um, yeah, but yeah. I'm a big, yeah, yeah, big no, believer in, in preparation. Um, and okay. by the time you get into that room, being so clear and specific on, okay, what are we writing about? Why are we writing about it? Like, why should anyone care? There's like 40 thousand plus songs that come out every day so why should i give a fuck about your song like it's got to come from a very real meaningful place um so yeah by the time we were in the camp we already had probably like 40 or 50 tracks that had been developed and probably about 80 to 100 concepts um and a crew of, uh, there was no more than six people a day, plus Angel Baby. Uh, and it went on for five days. Right. It's a lot of songs. I mean, that's awesome. That's a, a yeah, no, that, that's sick. 
And now, did you have a musician from the Board Ape community as well? Or like, was there, is there somebody from the Board Ape community that was represented on there? Or was it just a collab with Board Apes as a whole? Uh, there was, yeah. So one of the uh, A&Rs and producers that we've all become really close with at, at Hume, Angel, David, myself, is Gino the Ghost. And Gino has an unbelievable Halo ape. And uh, yeah. And we started working on the song. Huh? I, I actually wanted to have the first lyric. It's like, I got a halo, but I don't think I deserve it. But something must be working. Um, and yeah, it just felt it just felt perfect. The synergy of all of that. It also felt perfect having the first collaboration, being with the ape community, with David having minted an ape and being. I remember when we talked about that, and David's like, "This, this is interesting. Like, this is really cool. No one's ever done anything like this." Um, and from a 10,000 foot view, like going back to what we were talking about before of why we were so inspired to develop Hume to simult if you're going to simultaneously create uh, a studio that's able to fully develop every single aspect of a virtual artist from the business side to the creative side, um, but then also be developing an ecosystem and a, a platform that people can be a part of to interact with those artists and have fan to artist interactions unlike anything you've ever had before, you have to collaborate with other communities. Like you just have to start right. growing and developing. And that was, that was just a, a huge part of making that pivot. And it was, <coughs> it was a pivot. So, you know, um, like there was a whole other sound that we developed with Angel in February that are kind of like pivoting from Ivan and Peter. Although this time was a little different because people were a little attached to the music, including Angel. But yeah, I think it took three weeks and we threw everything out and started again. Um, what, made, what made you decide to pivot? It didn't feel real enough. It didn't feel authentic and real enough. And Angel Baby's story is so real. It's just a story of someone who lost the people they love. So the music should reflect that, you know? And I think also, right. you know, we had... A lot of the songs were very, like, crypto-specific. Um you know, and we started to look, and they had been written, and, you know, they'd been written earlier, and we were looking at, again, like, where's the world going? And it's like, a Web3 artist or a virtual artist doesn't need to, like, have all their lyrics just be about crypto. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. We need to have, like Jay was just saying, like, these, they need to be real. Angel needs real songs. Angel Baby needs right. songs that maybe you know like the other side if that you go listen if you go listen to the other side and you know about web3 you're gonna be like oh that's cool like oh they just said seed phrase in that line or the song's called the other side but if you just listen to that song and you don't know anything about web3 you're still gonna think it's an awesome song and you're still gonna feel like you can relate to it so it was really like about finding that balance um, so that, you know, we talk about Angel Baby being a meta star and Angel Baby having music that competes at that level. That's not just, you know, stuff that people in our community are going to get as an inside joke, but being able to hit both of those things. Right. Um, well, I mean, I know one thing your, your song was missing. It was missing the G Money shout out for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's coming, G, you know? That's coming. Um, but, you know, I, I, I kind of want to, you know, talk because I, I know we're running up on time here and I would be cognizant of your time. Um, you know, I, I think your philosophy around NFT utility is pretty interesting, right? You guys are taking the approach of less is more, right? Can, can you describe how you came about that strategy and why you chose that? Well, I think a, a lot of it is there's a lot of big communities out there. And I think with an artist, you want people to feel connected to that artist and like they're part of something that's 
exclusive and that they feel special. Like, I want to feel like I'm in the room with Drake or I want to feel like I'm in the room with Angel Baby. Um, and it's been really, really amazing. This other side release um, was the first step in that. There's only 50 music NFTs of the other side. We haven't talked about this too much, but the other side, that, that pivot seems to have worked. Like, other side is trending on, on Audius. I think it was on the music NFT side. I saw something this morning from some account that it's the second um, highest music NFT by volume um, mm. over the last week. So there's 50 of them. Each one allow lists you for the Hume Genesis NFT and the Block Tones NFT, which is uh, Block Tones Genesis, which is you know the Ghost project. But then it also, and we didn't tell we didn't tell people that they were going to be able to do this. But um, in the last three days, Angel needs to decide their next release now. Um, and there's two songs. One is featuring the the Moonbirds community. The other one's featuring the Quirkies community. And if you had that other side NFT uh, or Angel Baby's Metastar Poet, um, you were able to go in a token gated channel in the Discord. You were able to like you saw a huge letter from Angel Baby talking about like what you know what they're going through, why they're like they can't you know what what they're thinking about in terms of what their next release should be. Then people got to hear both songs or half of each of the song and then those fans now get to like they're choosing that they're choosing the next release um based on what they heard and it's been really that was really cool to see and then people you know seeing people debate which song should be released and i think you know that all goes back for me like being in those record label meetings and rooms for the first time and talking to jay so much and it's like all these people guessing on what fans want to have released want to hear. and what and right. now like we can have an nft that actually is a song like so it's a it's a it's like having a badass limited edition version of like a record that also allows you access in like this special room where you're also helping the artist decide what's next like music's never been released like that and those kinds of like fan to artist relationships have never existed and Jay said this on our Twitter spaces yesterday. I'm like doing this through Discord and the way we're doing it right now is like, it's like Morse code. Like, you know, where we're going is there's a platform, you connect your wallet, the Hume Genesis NFT allows you to go in. Um, you can preview the songs in there. Eventually you can do more than just, you know, help Angel Baby choose what song is next. There's, there's a lot of decisions right. the artist needs to make. So, um, yeah, I think I think that's really cool. I, I'm I'm kind of experiencing that a little bit myself with Emit One, where you know you you're developing this really cool and organic community that wants to see you succeed, and now you have your vision for what you think Angel, Angel Baby should do, and you have total creative control over that. But sometimes you want that community feedback of like, what do you what do you what do you guys think? Like, you know, which song? right uh you know where should angel baby tour like whatever whatever decisions you want to bring up to the community um i think could be pretty cool because it, it then becomes that interactive component where um you know angel baby is the hero of that story and you know they want to see angel baby win you know so I, I i know you brought up a little bit about the the genesis nft right and what 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 is it exactly what what can holders expect what's what's the alpha that you can share with us right now it looks badass, <laughs> and it is, a music, <laughs> it is a music NFT in itself. Um, I get that the part that I'll, I'll share is like, there's gonna be three tiers of influence. So, you know, everybody who, who was part of it, and if you weren't, you know, part of it, like y yesterday or on Wednesday, we did that thing where like, you could have any NFT, you could get into the token gated channel, and you could help Angel Baby decide. With the Hume Genesis, which all the music NFTs will allow list you for, there's gonna be three different tiers of influence. And depending on which NFT you have, you have a different amount of power in helping Angel make that decision. So if you have the legendary, which is the most rare, you're gonna have a lot more power and influence than someone who has the, um, the least rare. 
Um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be really interesting to like see those dynamics play out. Um, and we've designed it in a way, this might change, but I'm pretty sure this one's not, I don't think this is changing at this point, Jay. Um, we've designed <laughs> it, we've designed it in a way, and by the time it's released, it'll probably still be like this, where if all of the least rare people were to like vote together as a block, they would be able to out influence the highest holders. So there's some, there's some cool yeah. game theory um, and mechanics going on there that, that I think people will, will really enjoy. I like and, that uh, idea. And I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I like that idea. And I, I really want to stress the fact that you're sitting here talking about something that like you're probably, that you're very close to launching and you're still like talking about the design mechanics. And I totally relate to that because there's so much stuff where I'm like, okay, this is what we're going with. And then I talk to somebody about it and they're like, but what about this? And I'm like, fuck, that is such a good idea. Okay, like now <laughs> we need to think about it, right? I'm going to use uh, the admit one, like just the way we decided to mint it is like, we had so many different conversations like, okay, this is, this is the process. Okay, we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it that way. We're going to do it that way. And like, literally it just kept on being like, oh, like new information became available. Okay, should we do that? And I think that that's, that's the really cool part about, um, you know, being part of Web3, right? And just really, really being able to, to pivot and react to change, a change in information in real time and being nimble enough to, to move and, and carry on, right? Totally. I think I almost agree. every time we talk to you, um, there will be a nugget of information. And if it's just you and I, I'll probably call Jay after and I'll be like, G said this thing. I think we like really need to think about that. We really need to like change this this piece of what we were thinking. Um, but that's part. I, of I feel like there's yeah. one more piece piece of alpha, David. That would be nice. Maybe, it feel like it'd be nice if this was the first place where we talked about that. So I'll talk slowly, and if you want to cut me off, you can. But all all of the meta stars in the Hume ecosystem in the Humeverse are going to have their own Genesis NFTs. And the Hume Genesis is going to allow you to have influence across all of those meta stars. So it's another reason why this is such an important cornerstone, powerful NFT in the Hume world. You are going to be able to not only have influence by holding your Hume Genesis NFT, but also by holding the genesis is from the other meta stars and there there might be something where you're incentivized to hold it as long as you can because theoretically <laughs> that might make you more powerful um but yeah it's it's very exciting for us because gee we started talking to you about some of these things in october um and to finally watch it come to life has been really really cool especially seeing everyone fighting over the song yesterday and also the song that that is winning it's i would have never guessed um yeah it's not what we oh, thought really? was gonna happen That's awesome. yeah yeah it's the opposite by a landslide too by like an overwhelming landslide so it's uh it's really cool and can't wait to see this continue to grow on a mass scale that's awesome. I, I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I, I think what you guys have done to date is awesome. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that I get the chance to work with you guys very closely and, and help you on strategy and, and, and everything. I, I, I'm really looking forward to what you guys are doing because I think you guys have been really innovative. You guys have uh, been very nimble uh, when, when the market changes and, and figuring out what it is that, that you need to do to be successful and I'm, I'm really excited for what you guys are doing. I think you've done a great job and I'm looking forward to what the future brings. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I want to be uh, cognizant of time. I want to let you guys, uh, if people, if people want to follow up uh, and, and follow what you guys are doing in Angel Baby, what's the best place for them to reach out at? Uh, follow Hume. We are Hume on Twitter. Follow Angel Baby on Twitter. Um, and 
start. The- you could join the Discord. Come hanging out there. Uh, come into the Discord. But DMing, we are Hume. If you know you've got like any inquiries, probably the, the easiest way to to go. All right, awesome. And so then, before I let you go, besides uh, NF, besides any Hume ecosystem NFTs, what are your favorite I NFTs? I won. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, fuck. I, I got. I have. To, I'm probably gonna have to ask him that question. No, no. I, <laughs> what, what's your favorite um, NFT? <laughs> My I do love my favorite. Emit One <laughs> NFT though. I do, yeah. The Emit One NFT is pretty cool. Um, and and that that Discord, com- I, I went in the other. I was like, wow, it's like this is this is vibrant in here. Um, yeah, no, the Discord community has been really, really active. And awesome. Shout out to Emit One. <laughs> Man, that's hard. I mean, I I don't think it's my. Uh, I don't know, Jay. I don't know if you've got one off the top of your head. I was gonna say that I, I did. I scooped a goblin, um, and that project is just so ridiculous. I like just heard. I it was it was one of the. It was like 11 p.m. and I was like, "What is this Twitter space with 1,600 people in it?" And heard all these people making their goblin noises, and I was like, "This is a meme. Memes just fly in this world." I should scoop one of these. So that might be my favorite one right now. Um, it, it's just so ridiculous. I, I, I do, I do like how you said that. I feel like I, I like I appreciate how you hedge your bet by saying my favorite one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gonna change in four weeks. I I I do genuinely mean this, so I'm gonna say it because I would say it even if we weren't on this, but the value that I've received from holding the Gen 1 or Phase 1 Adidas NFT has been really amazing. And I, I thoroughly enjoy it. And I'm not trying to just like, uh, you know, <laughs> shill, shill your project. But I just think it's so cool. <laughs> and the fact that it like you burned it and that, and now you're seeing things come from the Phase 2. It's just... It's just been really cool, and I'm excited to see where it goes. And it's also held its value really well. So I'd say that that has been one of the best experiences I've had. Um, yeah. I do really like awesome. my new Killer Bear, awesome. though. I, I do like the Killer Bear. It's kind of cute. <laughs> but that's a, that's a right now. We'll what's see your, how it What's goes. your favorite <laughs> NFT right now, G? Um, I mean, of contemporary stuff outside of the new one. Um, you know, I, I, I always, I go, always go, always go, uh, I always go back to my favorite NFT. I don't think I even own it. Is the, the collab I did with Torky, uh, in January of last year, just because of what it meant and, you know, how, when we started working together, that really opened up my eyes to how I can help empower artists. And thankfully for me, that happened really early on, uh, in my uh, career with regards to NFTs. And so it just, it serves as like an awesome reminder to me of like, you know, something that could be so small and inconsequential for me could really mean something for somebody else. So, you know, that, that like, I, I experienced that a little bit with, with Admit One as well, where people that, you know, reached out to me and be like, oh my God, you don't know what this means to me and how it, it helped them through like a tough time or, or whatever it is that like, I wasn't even thinking about when I released it. So for me, it's like stuff like that, that I find like super important and kind of through the tough times, it helps me power through. Mm. So, all right, cool guys. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, you know, looking forward to everything you guys are doing and, you know, hoping, hoping that I can get on, on a collab on a track as a collab at some point in the future. Can happen. Careful what you wish for, G. Careful what you wish for. Thanks for having us, G. This was uh, was awesome. Thanks, G. Awesome. And everybody, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everybody. Bunnies up.